Hello, we're going to do a panel now on machine learning for education. It's really machine learning as a way to build educational applications that uh, exhibit artificial intelligence. I'm Jared Bernstein. I work at Analytic Measures Incorporated. And the, today the panel overview is gonna be an introduction of four short talks. The introduction is mine and it'll be 10 minutes long. And I'll just basically try to cover machine learning, very high level. Then uh, Grant Robery from LoomView is gonna be from Kings Peak Technology is gonna be talking about how LoomView supports English language learners. Then Clifton Rusebu from Myriad Sensors is gonna describe a project that he has funded by IES that uh, works on assessment for hands-on science. Then Masa Suzuki of Analytic Measures is going to present for 12 minutes more or less on a seamless early reading diagnosis. And the last speaker will be Chung Kai Wang from Coaps. Um, and he's gonna talk about personalized game-based vocabulary support or scaffolding. Um, I assume also for ELLs. Then we'll do questions and discussions and we have 25 minutes set aside for that. We encourage it. I believe this is gonna be presented as a recording. And so you can't ask a question while it's going on or while I'm talking or when any of these other four presenters present. So how do machines learn? What kind of offline process is behind an AI app, right? So an AI app is kind of nifty, it has some magic, but what do people do to build it? That's usually referred to as machine learning. And how do apps understand written or spoken language or track a student science experiment? That's what we're gonna to learn today in this session, this panel. So presuming that you've studied things like, you know, multidimensional scaling or clustering and regression, perhaps in graduate school or even undergraduate school, you should understand that supervised machine learning is essentially regression and that unsupervised machine learning really is just the same as clustering, multidimensional scaling or factor analysis. And that if you have an intuition for them, regression, clustering and so forth, then you probably have the right intuition for supervised and unsupervised machine learning as well. Note also that logistic regression is a common decision theory or decision process. And um, it's essentially the same as rush modeling, although it's usually done with only two variables. So I, I put up this picture and it says, boy, if you read about machine learning, you're gonna see all of these terms. And this is one website's sort of a mind map of what these terms are and where they come from. If you have access to these slides, you can look at it later. Um, so simple methods generalize. And when they generalize, they become machine learning more generally. So there's two, one is for prediction, something's gonna happen. The other is for classifying things that aren't previously classified or grouped. Linear regression is fit that line to those dots. And if you wanna think about what is supervised machine learning, it's just, well, any kind of fit to you know, a set of points in any number of dimensions with millions and one hopes even billions of examples. And then you just need to make sure you don't overfit. With linear regression, you don't have to worry about it, but with nonlinear regression, and with many machine learning tools, they're so good at mapping exactly what the data looks like that you have to have a training set and a, another set to go. And classification, typical linear classification just puts a straight line that does the best at uh, maximizing the distance from the line to the expected points on one side or the other of the line. Again, generalize that to find areas, how should I say, regions of a multidimensional space with millions of examples, and you're starting to think about machine learning.
but the basic idea is the same. I have a bunch of data. I don't know how to organize it. And how do I divide it up? So what is AI language processing? Because many of the things we're going to talk about are really artificial intelligence language processing. There's automatic speech recognition that takes a speech signal in and puts out words. There's natural language processing, which might be down the pipe. And that's something that takes, for instance, the output of a speech recognition system or the output of a keyboard and produces structure and presumably context context relevant meaning from those words. How do we evaluate spoken performance? That's something that I've worked on and analytic measures works on, which is I can hear somebody speaking. Uh, is the person speaking well? Is the person speaking English well? Is the person fluent? Is the person, uh, person articulate to have a good vocabulary, have good control of the phrase structure and even the paragraphic coherence in English. Machine translation, a well-known one, and now from Google and others, it's a very well implemented and publicly available. Go get a Russian text, turn it into English, get an English text, turn it into Armenian. Handwriting recognition is actually a little bit behind speech recognition, but I see a handwritten two-dimensional signal and I need to pull the words out of it. And then there's automatic dialogue management could either be for a chat in text or it could be voice interactive. These are examples of AI language processing. And that's the focus for, I think three out of the four of the presentations that follow. So how do machines learn? Well, I, I guess they do it kind of the way we do it by successive approximation. They learn a little, then they learn better and they keep hill climbing until they find the best fit. They tend to be iterative. So AI development at a very schematic level is, I have a set of human judgments, I have people acting, they could be moving objects, they could be talking, they could be typing, they could be gesturing. I have context data sequences, that is I know where I am in a sequence of operations or actions. And then I have outcomes, I put those into the, the pressure cooker, the machine learning, and I get out a set of models and I can apply those models in operation of an AI app, right? And that's where the magic seems to be. People do something or say something over here and it's said or done in context. And typically these days you're doing something like this with a client that could be on a phone or a tablet or a regular computer through a browser and some server system up in the cloud basically refers to these models and does the next thing that is amazing, really nifty. How did it know how to do that? I guess I wanted to present these two uh, slides, which were, how do you do that? Well, this was uh, development. This is the development path of a spoken English test that we did. We built it in 30 weeks, about eight months. And first you get a design and a spec and you collect a bunch of draft items. You pre-pilot them, make sure they're okay. This is for an assessment, right? And then we draft items, pilot the forms with two sets of people and we set aside one set and they do the same, the same work, but they also take concurrent tests to do a concurrent validation. We take their data, do score model development. We generate scaled items. Then if we're going to report subscores, do sub models, uh, subscore model development, and then we end up with subscaled items. We validate them against the concurrent test for this group that was not involved in the score model development. And we say, huh, we have optimized these scores here from the machine to match the concurrent test very well and also match the pilot form performances very well. And therefore, that's the end of the process. Another one that we did, I think I should uh, go away. I'm talking now for nine and a half minutes. This was a, a virtual interview practice profiler. And here again, we designed some probes. The probes are developed by experts to match concepts, con concept structures, right? And uh, rating rubrics and so forth. We put them in an app on a phone. We get a spoken response database. 
Then we have human raters. It could be HR people or career counselors or psychologists or whatever. We get profile ratings and feedback and guidance. Uh -huh. And then we do scaling on the profile ratings. We do clustering on the feedback and guidance, right? Unsupervised and unsupervised. And then we run machine learning, loop, 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 successive approximation until we have the best fit we can find, minimizing the difference between the machine output and the human output. And then we can just report it through an API. Okay, so I give a slide that has the um, contact information for all five presenters. And I just say thank you. Now to Robbery, then Ruzaboom, then Suzuki, and then Wang. Hi, my name is Grant Robbery. I'm going to be talking about how to support English language learners with Loomview's dynamic Diglot Weave. I am uh, the CEO and co founder of Kings Peak Technology Inc., um, and our product is called Loomview. So, this is not a surprise to anyone, but people are different. We look different, we talk different, we come from different places, we eat different foods. We know different things and we learn differently. And education is personal. Uh, it's a personal pursuit and it should be personalized for each unique student. However, that is uh, much easier said than done. And uh, it's almost impossible to have that happen. Teachers have large classes and can't create personalized lessons or give sufficient one-on-one -on -one attention to each student. Schools don't have enough resources to hire enough staff to fulfill the individual needs of each student. You can hire a private tutor, but they are expensive. Therefore, only the wealthy can benefit from that option. And that can create an even larger divide between rich and poor. Education is the great equalizer in society, but if we have unequal education, it's, we're gonna it's gonna be hard to have uh, equality later on. So how can we solve these issues? My personal belief is that it's through artificial intelligence and machine learning. So AI and machine learning are used extensively already for personalization. You interact with this personalization probably every day, whether that is Amazon recommending products you would like, Netflix suggesting a new TV show for you to binge, TikTok playing a video you will enjoy, or Google showing you an ad for something that you were just talking about. There are technologies out there that do a fantastic job of learning about us and personalizing content for our needs and wants. Let's apply some of these technologies to education to improve the world. So uh, like I said, it's, impossible, it's been impossible for teachers to create personalized materials for all their students. However, AI and machine learning can empower teachers to help their students more than they previously could. It can give the students what they need when they need it. It can also help teachers know what their students need. So the group we have chosen to focus our efforts on is one of the groups that most needs help, English language learners. In every subject area, English learners are far more likely to score below a basic level than their non-English learner peers. The focus of our LoomView product is to help reduce this gap by augmenting students' ability to read by leveraging their source language skills. So yeah, if you take a look at this graph, you can see just the drastic difference of students below basic levels. While there are many contributing factors that lead to lower scores by middle and high school English learners, those listed here are among the most significant. Comprehending subject area texts in English can be extremely frustrating and time intensive. Developing academic vocabulary in a variety of subject areas can be daunting. And not being able to speak to your teacher in your source language can make things even harder. So the goal of our LoomView product is to help create a level playing field or a more level playing field for English learners. And we do it through a, a technique called Diglot Weave. So for over 70 years, linguists have studied what is now referred to as a diglot weave reader, 
which blends two languages together into a single text. For example, imagine a native Spanish student who is learning English. A digot weave text like the one shown on the right could flip the hardest words into her native language of Spanish while keeping the rest of the words in English. Studies have shown that digot weave readers help students learn new vocabulary as well as drill and practice and better than reading solely in the target language or semantic mapping techniques. Students were less frustrated and had reduced anxiety as well as increased optimism when compared to reading a text solely in the target language. And students consistently report preferring digot weave readers over other techniques. Further studies suggest that combining digot weave reading with drill and practice of words encountered in the reading is the most effective technique. So despite the potential benefits of using a diglot weave reader, they have historically not been practical to use since you'd have to create a different book for each st student based on their native language, proficiency level, and vocabulary. Only recently with the improvements of advanced machine translation and alignment tools has the creation of dynamic diglot weave become feasible. And this has been the primary focus of our efforts with artificial intelligence. So the LoomView reader provides such personalization. Here is an example from LoomView. As you can see, it changes some of the words in English back into Spanish. This is a simple example, but we can provide a powerful benefit to students. LoomView helps them understand the text better, increase their academic vocabulary, and provide pronunciation help, among other things. We have seen that AI and machine learning can be powerful and extremely useful tools in personalizing education. So now I, I wanna talk about some of the approaches that we have taken and some of the approaches that uh, you may desire to take and, and just uh, talk a little bit about uh, some ed AI solutions that are out there. So some of the approaches that we have taken um, are, are listed here. We use machine translation to translate words and sentences, taking context into account. We use natural language processing uh, to parse text, provide parts of speech and lemmatization, among other things. We use speech synthesis to give pronunciations. Now we have not yet incorporated a recommendation engine into our product, but that is on our roadmap. With such an engine, we can personalize content even more to the student's needs. So here's some services that are already set up and easy to use. AWS, um, Amazon Web Services has uh, a plethora of services. Um, here's a few of them. Translate, uh, Poly. Poly uh, provides pronunciations, and that's actually what we use. Um, Personalize is a recommendation engine. SageMaker is a machine learning tool. And there's, there's dozens more. And if you don't like AWS, well, there's Microsoft, Azure, Google Cloud. They all have, they have a similar infrastructure as AWS. Um, there's a tool called GPT-3 that is a large natural language model that can provide really interesting um, output. And I would definitely recommend checking that out. There's a, and there's another cool company called Hugging Face that provides lots of open source machine learning models uh, available for free and, and easy to use. Now, <clears throat> Python, uh, the language Python is probably the most common in the machine learning field. And um, you can also, and you can build your own models in, in Python. Uh, and that's probably the easiest place to do it. And there's, there's some tools out there like PyTorch, TensorFlow, um, and Scikit-Learn. And uh, some, and those other companies I mentioned, they all have development kits for Python as well. And the, just the, the opportunities and the, you know, the possibilities are so exciting. They're exciting to us here at LoomView and they're, they're, they should be exciting to everybody because it's really gonna be able to augment uh, education and it's going to be able to provide a much better uh, future for everybody in my in my personal beliefs. And that's what we're working to do here at LoomView. And uh, just want to say thank you very much.
My name is Clifton Rusman. I'm the founder and CTO of Myriad Sensors, also known as Pocket Lab. And thank you for this opportunity to talk with you today. I'm going to continue the conversation about machine learning methods behind AI applications in education, talking about our project, uh, Taylor AI. And I'll begin with explaining exactly what Taylor AI is and then putting it in the context of our Pocket Lab system. So Taylor AI is an AI powered tool for formative assessment and student feedback for open-ended real world science activities. So a science experiment that a student would do like at the bench, um, like mixing um, chemicals to look at a reaction or doing a physics experiment, how can we provide um, formative assessment and, and guidance to that student in that context? The research, um, and the R&D investigation, and the question we're trying to answer is, how can we design this AI tool um, that can process a broad range of real world inputs from the student and provide feedback and guidance to the student and the teacher. And this is um, for mastery of the NGSS science and engineering practices. Um, and there's eight of these practices, um, things like data analysis, um, um, interpretation, uh, planning and investigation. How can we um, provide a tool to improve mastery of those practices? So what is Pocket Lab? Um, it's this solution that um, we have developed that has these four components, um, cloud software, we make hardware devices, uh, lesson plans, and then we have a professional learning community. Um, we uh, shipped our first product in 2015. And we, so we've been around for a little over six years. Um, so, Cloud software, that's the basis of what we do. And we provide a product called Pocket Lab Notebook. And you can think of it as a Google Docs um, for your science lab. For a student, it provides a notebook that they can do their activity. Um, and for a teacher, it has like Google Classroom type capabilities to manage what's going on. We have hardware devices. We have four on the market right now. And these are sensors that can measure things like light intensity, or temperature or um, acceleration or speed and send that data wirelessly to our notebook. We develop lessons, um, mostly supplemental um, in grades six through 12 um, for doing these hands-on science experiments. And then at the start of the pandemic, out of necessity, we started this uh, science community that we call um, Science is Cool, SCIC. And at this point, I, we believe it's the largest science conference in the world. We've had 65,000 educators um, uh, engage with us since we started it in 2020. So that is the Pocket Lab solution um, at its highest level, um, those four components. And drilling down more closely into um, how Taylor AI fits into this. Um, in this uh, and in this box, um, this checkered box, we have our existing solutions, um, which are commercially available and in use by tens of thousands of students right now. So we have our science experiments and the sensors that we use for data collection. Um, this sends data using Bluetooth to our um, cloud-based app notebook and interfaces with the teacher dashboard in Notebook. And Taylor AI will sit on top of um, that platform to provide to the student tutoring and feedback um, and to the teacher formative assessment um, of what's going on in his or her classroom. So here is a classic example of a physical science physics um, experiment that we might do with Pocket Lab, um, and then I'll talk about how Taylor AI fits into this. And this experiment is called a half Atwood machine. And it involves a cart um, that is attached to a string that hangs over a pulley, um, and then it's attached to a mass. And you hold this stationary, and then when you release it, the force um, from of gravity pulling on this mass, um, and then the tension in this string will pull this cart along a tabletop or a track. 
and it'll accelerate it down that track. And this is a classic way to look at Newton's uh, second law, F equals MA. So how we do this in the real world is we have um, our pocket lab Voyager sensor here, which will measure acceleration um, attached to a 3D printed cart. And this is on Hot Wheels track. And then in this cup on the end, uh, we can load it up with washers or weights, and then you release it and the string will pull the cart down the track. So in this animated GIF, you can see what happens. Um, it behaves like you would expect. So it's stationary um, and the, the data here, um, not, much, not much going on when it's at rest. And then you release it and the cart accelerates down the ramp um, at a constant acceleration and then it bangs into the pulley at the end. And so um, this, is, this is what a student, an eighth grade student, a 10th grade student in physics class would do. And this is the data that they would get from this, from this experiment. And the tricky thing is for most students um, that the relevant data is this relatively flat line here when the cart is accelerating at a constant acceleration um, down the ramp. But students get really distracted by um, these points, these big spikes here that result from the banging of the cart against the end of the track. And so when it's like a very, very common mistake when doing this activity is a student will key in on, on one of these spikes and think that is the important result from this experiment versus um, this uh, flat line here and finding the average um, data um, of this trend right here. So very, very common mistake that we see students make. So with Taylor AI, we're, we're figuring out, okay, how can we um, you know, guide a student through this type of activity um, with real world uh, collected sensor data? And in our phase one, um, these are some screenshots of our uh, prototype and this would be done in the notebook software. And um, with these windows popping up, guiding a student through the data collection and providing hints just in time, um, if we see them um, you know, misunderstanding something or um, misinterpreting the data, you know, just collecting data that's just incorrect for the activity. And so it's a series of pop-ups and, and other screens that help a student um, you know, understand what it is uh, that they're, what the data is that they're collecting. And then, um, so that, that was the research we uh, began in phase one. Um, and in phase two, we're continuing that, um, and I'll go into more detail, and also developing the teacher dashboard. And, and how do we provide um, this data in a quick snapshot to the teacher about the interventions that um, Taylor AI has made, um, what are the common uh, misconceptions and how, how can we you know, coach up the teacher to um, approach you know, the class and, and have this extra insight into what's going on. So that's part of the research question we're investigating in phase two. Um, so here's some uh, example data from our feasibility study that we, we did in phase one with a class of 12 students. And they, the students were doing two, um, two, two graphing exercises um, where they're interpreting, interpreting uh, graph data. And in this table, you can see how, what percentage of the students um, got the correct answer after, um, with zero interventions, one, two, or three or more interventions from Taylor AI. Um, so uh, you can see that most majority of the students um, required two or three interventions before they got the correct answer. And then um, after the activity, we had a, a separate but um, related um, exit ticket question. And you can see how many, with the percentage of students that answered that, cor that question correctly on the first try. So for activity one, 67% um, answered correctly first time, activity two, 75%. Even though it took these students, um, many students, uh, two and three um, attempts to um, 
at the initial activity. So we, we do see some, we do see improvement in, um, in understanding of these concepts, even through this very short activity. So this was promising, um, uh, a promising trend from our phase one research. And so drilling down into um, what was the type of intervention um, that Taylor A provided. Um, so we have two students here, code name. Um, so the student is code name hotel, the student is code name father. And um, they had on their graph, they had um, a misinter misinterpretation of what the flat slope meant. So here's an example of one of the interventions we provided. Um, this is an animated GIF. Um, and then the student on the exit ticket that had a corresponding question got it right on the first attempt. Uh, for this student father, uh, they had an incorrect interpretation of what the y-intercept me means. And then um, we provided a textual intervention and then they got the exit ticket question right on the first attempt. So case study data from our phase one project. And um, here's an anecdote from one of the feasibility um, uh, teacher participants that um, was very encouraging. And um, teacher was saying that engagement was high, every student was involved, and every student was trying to model the graph and the graphing experience. And I think there were kids who even, I think, would have played longer had we left them. And some kids asked me because they were back in class today, and they're like, when are we going to get those pocket labs out again? So. Uh, very promising results from our, our phase one um, study. So in phase two, uh, we're really, we're focused on a few key questions. First one is how do we pose a good problem um, for our Taylor AI algorithm? So we're targeting eight um, physical science activities. Um, these are at the middle school level. And we have lots of a priori information about what the students are doing. Uh, we know what um, the lesson is. We know all of the, the data from the sensor, um, the configuration, um, you know, everything in the lesson. So we have, we have lots of a priori information. So how can we properly and intelligently constrain the problem? Um, because we are dealing with real world data. So even though it is constrained, a student can, can collect, who knows, like infinite possibilities of data. Um, but how can, we, how can we use our constraints intelligently um, in our algorithm? And what we're seeing um, from the work that we've done so far in approaching these, these activities, um, we're comparing you know, some basic statistical and algebraic approaches with machine learning approaches and trying to understand which works better for which problems. And um, you know, it's very problem specific about the particular lesson the, the, that you know, so far we've seen. So um, a chemical reaction activity, um, you know, right now is looking like it requires a different approach than a physical, like, like that half Atwood activity, um, just in the way that we're so far approaching the, the algorithm the development and, um, and creating these interventions. So, when we, when we do a machine learning approach, um, we are taking this, um, a convolutional neural network, CNN, um, where we treat the data actually as a graph image. Um, so we have this tabular data, but uh, one of the CNN approaches that has proven effective is to treat that as an image and do, um, and have our algorithm work on them as images because of the you know, rich library and starting points for, um, for that kind of approach. And then the question is, well, how do we power up the teacher with this extra knowledge that we're getting from Taylor AI? How do we present this data in a timely fashion that a, that a teacher can get this snapshot of you know, 30 students um, working in, in her class simultaneously? And that's a, a very, very in-depth question, uh, UI UX question that we're investigating and exactly how we approach it. So we're sort of just at the beginning of our um, phase two development, um, but you know, we're, we're really excited about the application of AI in this realm. Um, 
because it's it's been used a lot. We we believe for you know math and for um, simulation based work, but to bring it into the real world um, where you know anything can happen, um, we believe is is novel. So thank you for your attention. Um, if you have questions, please reach out to me. Uh, my contact information is there. And here's an example of some students in Longview, Texas, doing a pocket lab activity. They're modeling um, how exoplanets are discovered. So they're using a pocket lab sensor, a light sensor to, to act like a telescope. And as a planet orbits a star, which is represented by the light bulb, um, that transiting, you can see a decrease in the light intensity that would reach that telescope. And this is a model of how, you know, real astronomers discover exoplanets. And this is um, just one of the ways that people use Pocket Lab and how we want to, you know, apply um, our AI tools um, to help guide them. So thank you for your attention. And I look forward to interacting with everybody here. My name is Masanori Suzuki. I'm from Another Majors Inc. And I'm going to be talking about automated skill estimation in all reading fluency. I'll give you a, a little bit of overview of uh, all reading fluency first, so you can see how my project fits in today's uh, discussion. And the, the project that I'm talking about today is called Skill Check Project. Um, it is a, a project to develop automated diagnostic uh, skill estimates from all reading fluency performances. And then I will walk you through the uh, R&D uh, development process for skill check. First, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on all reading fluency. Uh, in 2000, National Reading Panel published a report teaching children to read and identified these five areas as uh, critical early reading instruction areas for young reader to be successful. And the fluency, it's written fluency here, but it's really all reading fluency um, is a critical piece, as you can see. So fluency is an important piece. And what is all reading fluency? And fluency, or reading fluency is defined as the ability to read texts orally with speed, accuracy, and proper expression. So there are three key performance areas that are critical for oral reading fluency or successful oral reading fluency. Um, fluency requires rapid decoding and word recognition skills. Um, if you don't have good decoding skills or if you don't have good sound system of the language, um, you may be uh, using a lot of time just trying to decode the words instead of reading the text for meaning. So that's why fluency is an important skill and skilled fluency reading is pretty important. And that's also exactly why um, fluency contains a lot of good information about readers' skills. And I'm going to just quote one sentence from a recent uh, publication from NAEP uh, of 2018 NAEP or reading fluency study. There is a sentence that says, I quote, all reading fluency is a reliable and easily accessible indicator of all reading competence, a strong marker of progress in learning to read. And its assessment has become one of the primary means of determining which elementary school students are on track towards reading goals and which, which students would benefit from additional services and intervention. And because, and I quote, because um, or reading fluency requires an orchestration of many skills, it reveals information, rich information about reader skills. And if you Ask uh, experienced reading specialists and teachers, sort of top of the line in the district type of reading specialists. They would say that, yeah, if I listen to all reading performances, they can sort of identify um, problematic areas of those students. So the goal is to develop automated diagnostic skill estimates from passage read allows. Can AI system be developed to do that job that experience reading specialists can, can do. So right now, this is 
how the uh, all reading fluency benchmark assessment are typically administered. It's a manual process. Teachers sit down with the students, and as the students read the passage text out loud, teachers makes a, a record of reading errors that students are making. And, and after that, they ask comprehension questions. So once they have WCPM, which is words correct per minute, and a comprehension and accuracy score, they determine reading level. And then uh, they would know which students are reading above grade level, a lot above grade level, or at grade level, or below grade level, or some stu which students are reading at risk. Once those at-risk students are identified, schools, teachers may administer additional diagnostic tests to further diagnose those students' reading skill areas. What problems do they really have? Right now at AMI, we have already automated the first part of this process, uh, or reading fluency benchmark assessment. Now, Moby, Moby Read is a fully automated or reading fluency assessment using speech recognition technology. So the students are self-administering the or reading fluency assessment. They interact with the system for 12, 40 minutes. And then at the end, our system automatically generates words correct per minute comprehension scores, accuracy scores, and expression scores, and reading levels as well for the teachers. So the teachers actually don't have to do this by themselves. That saves a lot of time for teachers already, maybe up to 25 hours a year. Now, with skill check, we're trying to further reduce the burden that teachers and students have by going through this additional diagnostic test. So as I said earlier, if the skilled uh, reading specialists can identify problematic areas, we should be able to do it with machine learning. And that's what skill check is trying to do. So how do we go about it? So we've already developed the core technology and I want to show you what we went through here. Uh, the model development and optimization process for skill check core technology. So first we have students uh, reading performances. So students are reading passages out loud. Uh, those are all Moby reads. This is done in the context of Moby read. Um, so we have Moby read uh, passages and students reading performances and using speech recognition technology, which is spoken language processing, we can extract many kinds of performance data, such as words correct per minute, or what kind of reading miscues the students made. Did they make the students make insertion errors, or substitution errors, or omission errors? And then how about the timing information for phrasing and the pausing? So we can extract such information. Now, in order to train our um, automated skill profiler or skill estimate model, you need to have a target data against which a model can be trained and optimized to predict such target data. That target data came from human annotations. So we hired a group of 10 reading specialists who went through 3,600 recorded performances from grade one through four students. And then those responses were all um, annotated by uh, uh, two independent, uh, two reading specialists independently. So that resulted in over 7,400 annotations. So that serves as a ground truth sort of data. And then um, from the passage text, we applied natural language processing technology to extract text analytic data, such as which words are um, sight words or not, which words are decodable, which words required what grade level ph phonics rules. So with all that information, um, we 
combines the data to predict the uh, reading problems or evaluates the performances of readers and they identified which areas are strong or weak um, of those readers. In that process, of course, um, as I said, uh, human annotation data served as the true profiles, and that is the target for machine learning. And from the data we extracted using spoken language processing and natural language processing, the model tried to predict the problematic areas or performances in, in, in areas. And then the key point here is that the optimization process by comparing the results from automated profiles and then checking those results against the true profiles by human judgments of human uh, spe reading specialists, we went through iterative process to minimize the difference between the two. And that's the optimization loop. To, that's how you would optimize the machine uh, or automated scoring models. So here's the annotation categories that reading specialists use. There were six major categories and 20 subcategories in total. They logged into a web interface and listened to uh, a performance and then made annotation, um, made judgments uh, on 20 categories. And that serves the, the target data. A little bit about the data we used. Um, there were uh, 1,200 tests and over 3,600 recordings, and they came from grade one through four. And there are 36 passages in total. And for each passage, we had about 100 students' data, and we oversampled for struggling readers to make sure that we had enough data for um, problematic areas. And as I said, there were 10 reading specialists. And before we started training our models, we checked how consistent these two human uh, reading specialists, specialists were for each category by using exact agreement. Um, so we got about 70% uh, or higher in most of the categories. So we were very uh, happy with the result and agreement. And if you don't have a good agreement between two human readers, that's not going to give a, a good training data for um, AI scoring models. I mentioned text analytic data. Um, that really uh, boils down to two areas. Uh, one is lexical properties. So for each word in the uh, what we read passages, we um, assign the categories, whether those are sight words or not. Um, if what kind of phonics rules are required to read those words. And if those require uh, phonics rules, then what is the mastery grade levels? So we had all that information for every single word in the passage. We also created uh, phrase groupings for each sentence so, so that we understand how complex each sentence these students are reading. Here's an example of the current uh, skill check page. So uh, teachers uh, can see an overview of the uh, profile of the uh, reader and it's color coded, green, yellow, or red. And uh, these color coding decisions were uh, driven by the aggregation of the uh, data from the students who read three passages of Moby Read in the benchmark. And uh, some of the areas are, uh, have a link. Um, for example, you can see text level decoding. There are steps required. Uh, there are 12 steps um, that we have in the recording, in the decoding uh, list. And let's say if you click step two, for example, you get a, a new pop-up window, which shows uh, uh, the words that students have difficulty with. So the teachers can actually see which words students have trouble with. And if you click one of those words, then teachers can actually listen to the portion of the text 
uh, passage text that students read, and they can actually listen to uh, the performance, and then you know they can better understand how students actually read and how what kind of mistakes they made. So in a nutshell, uh, what I showed you right now is just a core tech development um, as part of the whole uh, skill check project. We developed the uh, first version of core tech develop core, core technology for skill check, and we are working on product development right now. And then after that, we will do a full validation uh, through randomized control trial efficacy studies in the representative sample schools. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for having me today. Really happy to be here. Um, excited to share what we did uh, with Pictoward School. And so today I'll be talking about a uh, machine learning model behind uh, Pictoward School. My name is CK. Um, uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, um, at Chunkai W. Um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of KuApps, um, also the principal investigator um, of our phase two SBIR grant. Um, I did my master's and uh, bachelor's at Stanford, uh, started um, my career at Microsoft Game Studios, worked on Xbox 360, uh, then later I moved to Microsoft Research, worked, worked on machine learning for several years. Um, then later on, taught at UW for a couple of years with scalable web services. Um, and uh, yeah, my background at Microsoft Research has been really instrumental uh, in us building this product. Um, at Microsoft Research, I worked on NLP um, and named entity recognition. This is our leadership team. Uh, the broader team has uh, extensive experience in uh, AI, ML, uh, education, R&D with Ellie leading our efforts here uh, on the research side uh, and game development uh, with Paul, uh, art director and Mike C, um, our head of design. Uh, and Pick the Word School lies at the intersection all of these areas. Likewise, our advisors um, have an extensive experience in AI, gaming, um, uh, and, game, uh, and game development um, and analytics. Uh, Johnson uh, was actually my mentor at Microsoft um, and he was the ex-director of engineering at Microsoft AI, uh, who I learned a lot from during my time over there. Uh, here's the story behind Pick the Word School and how it all started. Uh, we actually started from a commercial app um, on the iOS and Android app store. Um, Pick the Word originally uh, launched in 2013, uh, so it's been almost uh, 10 years since we launched this game. Uh, it's been growing every year since. Um, Pick the Word was designed as a fun and engaging word game, um, and the premise of this game is we show you two pictures uh, to combine um, and form a single uh, multi-syllable word. After, since launching uh, Pick the Word, we've received uh, beautiful feedbacks uh, from our uh, customers that love this game. Uh, we've received feedback from students and teachers that Pick the Word uh, helped them with vocabulary acquisition. And we've had uh, loyal um, uh, users uh, tell us that it's uh, helped them uh, alleviate uh, learning anxiety, uh, build their confidence in classrooms. Um, Pick the Word's also being used in um, brain uh, injuries and speech therapy for kids. Uh, we realized, this was when we realized that Pick the Word really uh, has grown beyond um, uh, just a fun game, but also into uh, helping the world, uh, helping everybody learn, uh, learn English. We've been lucky to have over 43 million users of our original Pick the Word game uh, and counting. Um, this is important because we are able to gather product feedback across a large set of users um, and uh, learn uh, their activities, behaviors, when, whether they're engaged in the game or disengaged in the game. Uh, within the context of ML, uh, this is uh, critical with a large data set uh, to, our, to train our models. Uh, English language learners um, are the fastest growing segment of the public uh, school population. Uh, ELLs face greater academic obstacles compared to native English speakers. Uh, vocabulary is foundational in literacy uh, and language instruction. Um, and we wanna build tools that really help uh, kids and teachers uh, uh, learn English uh, more effectively. Uh, this is when we realized 
uh, with Pick the Word, we had the foundation for what could be a new and innovative language learning tool. Um, and so we decided to build uh, a supercharged classroom specific version of Pick the Word called Pick the Word School. Pick the Word School, like the original Pick the Word app, provides fun and challenging word puzzles uh, with pictorial cues. And so with this example, a uh, screenshot of um, our game, uh, it's a gamified and self um, uh, motivating um, uh, uh, game. And, um, and we give hints and language uh, support in the home language, um, actually, to provide support. And so it could be uh, Spanish and, and Chinese. So you see the icon uh, on top of the image um, and uh, will, uh, yeah, will help um, English language learners a tremendous amount. Um, this is a tool that benefits all, lang all learners, but specifically uh, English uh, ELLs. Um, and what makes Pick the Word a uh, school particularly unique is its adaptive content. Diving into a little bit more of the algorithm and adaptive content, uh, Pick the Word School is responsive to shifts in students' play patterns um, that keep each learner engaged. And so here's a flowchart. Um, at any point in time, uh, our ML algorithm is trying to decide whether this uh, student uh, is likely engaged or disengaged. Um, once we decide that this, um, once we detect that this student is disengaged, uh, we will give them a fun uh, re-engaging puzzle, um, such as a puzzle like hot dog, um, uh, hot dog tastes good, and, um, and there's a pet uh, and, a, uh, and a fire icon. Um, and so that's, uh, we would classify that as a re-engagement um, uh, puzzle that is, uh, uh, that is fun and, um, and can spark sort of uh, real world um, uh, uh, sort of positive emotions. Uh, if the student is likely engaged, we then analyze whether they're doing poorly or doing well uh, with their current learning process. Um, and if they're doing poorly, we give a slightly easier puzzle. Um, and if they're doing well, we give them a different puzzle aligned to their learning goals. To predict students' engagement, our retention algorithm uses over 200,000 anonymous user data from the broader Pick the Word app. We take into account feature data such as number of puzzles they've completed, number of sessions they're playing uh, per day and cumulative, number of hints they're using, number of guesses they're making on each of the puzzles, uh, and whether or not they're solving the puzzle correctly. The current model that we're, uh, we're seeing really good um, uh, results on is a gradient boosted tree. Uh, this is a, a cascading if statement tree uh, that uses uh, features that we've predefined uh, to determine the likelihood of whether or not our student is engaged. The output value of a great, uh, GBT uh, is between negative one and one, where negative one represents uh, disengaged and 1.0 means uh, fully engaged. And so we're able to flag users who are about to churn. For example, if a user completes 10 puzzles in one session, he or she is likely uh, very engaged and playing a lot. On the other hand, if a user completes three puzzles over 10 sessions, he or she is likely getting stuck a lot and disengaged. This visual representation on the right side is a, a 3D representative. Um, uh, representation uh, with three uh, features um, to make it easier to see. But in fact, we use um, uh, much more than this, about uh, 10 to 12 features uh, that we use uh, in our ML algorithm. Uh, these uh, three uh, features currently in this uh, diagram uh, is session zero games complete, um, session zero length uh, in um, uh, minutes, and session zero completion um, time average, how long it uh, it took you to complete each of the puzzles. If a student is engaged but struggling, we then take into account word features, um, the similarity of words um, uh, and how they sound, um, and try to give a puzzle, um, give a word uh, that the student is uh, likely to guess correctly. Uh, for example, if they've guessed, you know, talk correctly, uh, but they're still having a hard time with other puzzles uh, and other words, uh, we will give them a puzzle where the answer is walk. 
Um, and so in this particular ex uh, example, the hemming distance uh, is one and uh, they sound similar. They have um, uh, similar uh, patterns and, and they're both uh, verbs that a human uh, can do and therefore uh, more likely um, uh, uh, that, a user, uh, that a student that is engaged but struggling uh, to get this uh, puzzle correct. Uh, with our current GBT uh, model, um, our AUC uh, or area under the ROC curve is at 0 0.7 using 200,000 user uh, 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 data points uh, in the US. Um, we're working to improve this further, but we're, uh, we're pretty um, yeah, excited and encouraged, uh, encouraged about this result and progress we've done so, uh, we've had so far. A little bit about limitations. Um, our model uh, is dependent on features we've uh, created. Um, typically, uh, machine learning models fall into two camps. Uh, one, either um, uh, models that we have to predefine features and uh, come up with them, um, uh, or other models such as deep learning um, and neural nets where uh, the model is able to learn uh, features on their own. Um, the main reason uh, we chose uh, the, uh, the former is because the latter requires a lot more data, uh, probably in the billions of data points, um, which, um, yeah, which in the future we will have, but we currently um, uh, do not. And so the former machine learning, uh, more traditional MLMAP algorithms uh, will actually be more effective uh, with the current data set we have. And so we're able to uh, bootstrap um, our ML model, uh, the GB tree, uh, GBT tree um, I uh, mentioned earlier um, with our original pick the word data. Um, uh, however, uh, because the original pick the word app um, only has uh, one game mechanic, whereas the new pick the word school we're building actually has um, uh, four to six game mechanics, um, uh, uh, the data uh, we're able to use as bootstrap, um, but, uh, uh, but is not one-to-one -one correlated. And this leads us to our future um, uh, uh, iterations and where we're exploring uh, on the ML side. Um, we want to refine our model uh, with additional student data uh, that we're gathering as part of this uh, phase two research. Uh, we're gonna be launching um, a uh, pick the word school a commercial game uh, where uh, it will have all four to six uh, different game mechanics uh, that we can then learn how students um, uh, uh, are engaging with them and therefore be able to more accurately uh, predict uh, churn and engagement. Um, uh, we're also looking into uh, clustering algorithms um, to help um, uh, identify uh, perhaps um, specific puzzles where other students are likely to uh, engage or churn and use that to help identify um, and help um, set the context of whether this student um, is, uh, is engaged uh, or not. For example, if 90% you know, of um, students um, are disengaged with this puzzle, uh, maybe there's a bug in this puzzle, then perhaps this particular student, student A, that is um, having a hard time and disengaged with this puzzle is not really uh, the student uh, per se, but it's more uh, to do with this sp specific puzzle. Um, and so a lot of exciting um, uh, 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 areas where uh, we're considering and we're further uh, 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 iterating on our model uh, and improving. Uh, but yeah, again, you know, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, any questions, you can find me on, um, uh, uh, on Twitter, or LinkedIn, um, and here's my email, chunkaiw at coapsinc.com. There's a question in the chat from uh, Gina Biancarosa. Chat, okay. I'm not sure if I said that right, but, um, and I can read it. Thank um, you. Throw it out there for the presenters. Given the theme of the conference, I wonder how each of the presenters is attending to DEI issues and their development efforts. For example, with the oral reading fluency product, how have you attended to dialect accent or enunciation issues? Vocal recognition AI is notoriously biased by what it's trained on. I, I guess I, I could answer that simply and I hope helpfully, which is I think the notorious is the key word in there. Uh, notorious, yes. In fact, even a group of 
people I know, a couple of them from Stanford, have produced a, uh, a paper that was then covered in the New York Times saying that there was uh, a big difference in commercial recognizer accuracy depending on the demographic features of the speakers. And uh, our experience is no, it's not so actually. And if you have the data trained right, you don't get it. So um, if you like, I can send you a link to a paper where we did speech recognition in 2003, four, 16 years ago for NAEP, the National Assessment of Education Progress, where we did scoring of adults and they were scoring of adults reading. And the IES that runs NAEP was worried that there was this problem. And we did a fairly reasonable analysis, pretty expensive analysis to show that there was no bias in the scoring in that circumstance. And uh, I, I guess in general, I think that it's, if you do your training data on a representative sample, then you're recognition is gonna be pretty unbiased. That's my opinion. Somebody else have another one? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say I definitely agree with that, uh, what Jared said. Um, on our side, most of our learning is actually on the behavioral side. So whether they get the uh, puzzle correct, um, how many times they guess, how many times they type wrong. Um, and so those signals, um, yeah, are pretty uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, diverse, and inclusive. Um, for, for pronunciations, um, uh, that is something that we're actively thinking of. Um, uh, yeah, I know for some of the models that large companies like AWS and such have, uh, they have a general trained model and then we can augment that model uh, with, um, uh, yeah, with our own data set. And so, um, yeah, we'd be looking into that and, you know, depending on, you know, which school district, um, making sure that we're able to uh, not forget about any student and be able to train the model and augment it uh, with our own data set. Um, but, uh, but training from scratch, I think, um, uh, uh, yeah, probably at our scale, um, training is, you know, text, uh, speech to text model from scratch is probably um, less feasible, uh, but augmenting it, I think some platforms allow you to do that. Okay. Masa, do you have anything else to say there? No, I, I think the uh, representation of data um, and considering this, the student population is the, probably the most important thing. Yeah, and John Sabatini is writing in to say that uh, NAEP is run by NCES and not IES. Mea culpa. I've um, noticed a couple more questions come in the chat, um, so I'll just sort of maybe help uh, facilitate this. One I see from John, he asks, for anyone, what are you learning about school's aptitude for integrating your products into curriculum? I can speak on uh, Pocket Lab and our Taylor AI project. Um, so we're we're largely supplemental to science curriculum, and um, you know, especially in in the the last two years with COVID, um, you know, the schools are dealing with m way more basic issues than um, you know supplementing their you know their their science labs. Um, so I think it, like so sort of very recent history, it's been difficult to get, um, you know, the attention that we we had before, um, but we are moving more towards core curriculum and uh, being able to teach fully from like using pocket lab tools. And um, I mean, that's that's where we feel like we need to move for uh, really uh, market adoption is being being used every day in core instruction versus um, just supplementing um, where there are gaps. Thank you for that, Clifton. Um, another question that came in the chat uh, is from uh, Jin Wei. Uh, I apologize if I mispronounced your name. 
um, and she says this is particularly for Chiang Kai. Can you elaborate on how to measure engagement? Sure, happy to do so. Um, we take a, um, uh, a several signals such as you know number of sessions, session time, game complete. Uh, in our games, we have hints as well. So um, if a student is stuck, um, uh, they're uh, yeah they have the option of using hints um, to try to um, uh, uh, better guess the answer. And so we could reveal the first letter or the last letter um, and such. And so. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, we track all of these behaviors um, and will then in turn learn the difference between engage versus in disengage. Um, you know, a little bit of an extreme, let's say if somebody came in and they didn't know the answer, kid came in, they didn't know the answer and they immediately quit, um, that'd be a very strong signal that they're disengaged. Uh, whereas on the other hand, if, um, if a student is struggling, but you know, uh, using a lot of hints, uh, guessing a lot of incorrect answers, um, then uh, then this student is um, uh, uh, is engaged but struggling. What, what what I missed there this time as well is what is the what is the criterion signal? What what how do you really know if somebody's engaged? I think you said you set aside some data and a sample, and then you had human judgments or what? I I, I missed it. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, for us, it's really more unsupervised model uh, because we have um, a lot of um, data from our public game, 40 million uh, users, um, and we generally know sort of benchmarks in mobile gaming, such as, you know, 40% day one retention is very, very good. Um, uh, we're able to use that to correlate with um, uh, signals very early on, like if a user completes, uh, let's say, you know, five puzzles in their first session, right. they're very likely correlated to, you know, day one retention and such. Um, and uh, yeah, and so um, we've thought about labeling, um, uh, uh, but we've generally seen sort of uh, labeling be uh, a lot less scalable. Um, yeah, sure. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, we have, uh, yeah, 40 plus million users um, and we have pretty good industry benchmarks um, on the commercial. Yeah, team. but you, you, could, you could sample the high retention and low retention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then do a label on a small exactly. set and see if you go to, you know, if that works there as well. Yeah. You, you yeah. mentioned that you're working on four to six game mechanics. Yep, that's correct. And I I wonder if you could tell me more about game mechanics in general. Yeah, sure. Um, so the original game mechanics um, is we show you two pictures, and so it could be foot plus ball, and the answer is football. Um, we have other game mechanics where we have um, the students match the picture. So when we say, uh, let's say the couple of words are football, you know, soccer ball, basketball, and then they would match the photos. Um, uh, as well as we're working on one that is um, uh, uh, that is speech to text, and so we show a photo and have the student uh, pronounce the word um, and such. And so, uh, yeah, we're exploring with a couple of different um, uh, mechanics, uh, but overall, um, yeah, on the ML side, we're definitely we're yeah fortunate to have a lot of data, and so we use the semi-supervised uh, method, like you were saying, where you know uh, good retention users, low retention users, and we label that group um, as such and so semi-supervised. Um, uh, yeah, and so the different um, uh, mechanics um, allows us to um, uh, uh, to accomplish uh, different learning objectives. Uh, so like sentence construction and uh, pronunciation and all of that. Um, and so we actually also are working on a different uh, mobile app um, and launching that uh, possibly next month uh, to collect data on the different mechanics because the original pick the word um, is only the um, compound uh, word mechanic uh, that we have data on. Okay, I'm seeing a question from Catherine Shields for Pocket Labs, otherwise known as Glyphton. And, and it says there were, you know, there are some uh, problems lend themselves to stats and algebra, but others ML. And then you talked about this connection machine there. Could, could you say more about that? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question, Catherine. And we are, we're, we're trying to do uh, two things with Taylor AI. I mean, we're, we're trying to automate um, this, this guide through a lab activity and helping the student both you know, collect the correct data and then analyze and interpret that data correctly. And so, like for the example that I gave where you have a car that's being pulled down um, a track with a 
like on a pulley with a mass. Um, we want to both check that they did that setup correctly, um, that they didn't like, you know, drop the car off off of the uh, edge of the desk. And then also, when they're looking at that data, that they're pulling out the relevant data points. So you know, so in some ways, you know, we can use, we we can treat these graphs as images and use these machine learning libraries to classify them. And um, that's a well-posed problem in, in some of those respects. But we also, we need to know what, what is the data point that they need to pick out and like, what is that numerical value? And then like in further down in the activity that did they, did they get that value correct? And that, that's very easy to do using, you know, algebra um, and knowing, you know, what to expect from that um, kind of activity. So yeah, to us, the importance is the automation of the feedback. And um, you know, we're, we're trying out different approaches and um, we're in building out this library of eight physical science activities. We're finding that you know, the easiest approach is kind of, is kind of different per um, activity. There's a question from Mike San Pedro, uh, who's saying, I wonder if each of the panelists could uh, speak a little more about the kinds of features or data input data that they're giving to their products actually to giving to their product development engine i think is what it means um for the kind of predictions that you're making so i think that uh, masa suzuki gave actually a fairly clear picture and I, I i think that ck did as well but we don't have well grant's gone and uh, Clifton, maybe you could start, but we could each say, what is the input data that we use to train the models that sit behind the product? Clifton? Yeah, well, we have our, um, the sensor data from our experiments and the graphs that, that generate. And then we have our uh, developers that are, um, that are creating, you know, that are classifying, um, you know, good data and what are the, and, common mistakes um, that from uh, their experimental setup or um, for the for the resultant that would be um, pulled from that um, experimental trial. Um, and then yeah, that's primarily what we're what we're feeding into our, you know, the experiments, our, our experiments with our um, on the machine learning or the, you know, the, the simpler statistics um, approaches. Okay. CK yeah. or Masa? Oh, I can I can go next. Um, okay. For for skill check uh, that I talked about, um, the the performance student performance data that goes into the training, and then we we recruited a group of reading specialists to annotate those performances with 20 categories. So the, the judgments are also input data for machine learning. Um, and then there is a, a speech analyzer or spoken language processing data uh, from a speech recognition system that goes into the machine learning uh, or combi combination algorithm development that goes into it. Um, and then there's a, a uh, I call, we called it text analytic data. So these students are reading passages. So we analyze those passages for each word, for lexical properties, and also syntactical complexities. So those are sort of the sources of uh, input data for machine learning. Yeah, I, I would speak a little bit more detail on that one because I actually did that sure. last part. <laughs> yeah. Which is... For each word, we had a list of which letter to sound correspondent rules you would need to know in order to decode the word and what the morphological form of the word was and what suffixes they were. And we did an automatic parse of every form and then took the surface of that parse as a potential predictor of correct, incorrect, or better yet, appropriate or inappropriate pausing and F0 contours. So um, the letter to sound stuff was done by hand, but the parsing was done with reference to fluency performance that was done automatically. And, you know, 
by an NLP system. CK, you had a slide that, that showed quite nicely what you Yeah, were. yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, yeah, so we tracked uh, things like game complete, hints usage on their first day and first session. Uh, those tend to be very strong signals, um, uh, yeah, of engagement. Um, and so in terms of uh, input, it's mostly use uh, player activity um, and how they engage with each of our puzzles, a uh, number of times they've uh, guessed answers and such. Uh, we also have like an avatar system. So the, so the larger meta progression is uh, they have their own avatar and as they guess puzzles correctly and, and complete more and more learning objectives, they collect coins that they can then buy uh, sunglasses um, and change their hairstyle. Um, so it's actually a lot of fun. And uh, that also ends up being a, a pretty strong uh, long-term signal uh, for engagement is, uh, you know, when uh, when they, you know, unlock their first sunglass uh, versus, you know, never having unlocked any customization. Uh, those are all uh, very, very strong signals. So for us by far, it's um, usage activity. Um, uh, but uh, but we do take you know inputs such as speech to text to make sure you know they pronounce the word correctly. Um, the current speech to text engine is out of the box. We use an API. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, but we hope to be able to train it uh, a little bit more. If um, uh, yeah, if we see that you know there's uh, some, uh, yeah sort of pronunciation bias in there. Um, uh, but the API currently is working pretty well. Uh, but we'll find out more as we. Yeah, test with teachers in classrooms. You know. Yeah, what I find interesting about what you just said was that you you mentioned this, you know, avatar dress up business. So it's sort of an ancillary activity. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But the ancillary activity could be a very nice engagement measure too. Yep. I think I, I like that. We're we're gonna build that Masa. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh so, hey, Grant, are you in this session? <laughs> yeah, we don't know. Um, all right, I don't know. I, I think that uh, the, the, the main question I had really was for Grant, who doesn't seem to be here. CK, I mean, I think all the presentations were really good, including Grant's, who's not here to accept the compliment. Um, I, I was happily surprised so far. If there's more questions, we have another minute and a half, two minutes, let's do it. There's, um, I there's a question. Oh, there's a question in the chat from John um, about helping English language learners, and if you can yes. flip the script and use it for example to help build Spanish vocabulary. Yeah, I, I think in in many such things, or what CK was talking about, the kind of things that we've built at at Analytic Measures Incorporated. You can flip them. It's uh, there's some work, but it can be done. The, the point, I guess, in opposite is worldwide and the United States, the market is in English. People coming from another language into English, and worldwide that's true by a lot. And in the United States, it's even more true. Canada too. So that's sort of it can be done, but uh, the economics of it are less favorable. What do you think, CK? Yeah, I totally agree. I think our first uh, step is to, um, uh, yes, yeah, to you know, do really well on the English side and um, and scale out our product there and start selling to schools. Um, but after that, you know, other languages and even other subjects um, uh, will uh, will be very interested in. And because uh, the signals that we use are behavioral, um, it scales. Um, uh, uh, yeah, easier across different languages and such. So. Okay, John sending in another one, a small one here. And it says for the future, ML and AI is shown here, just gets better and better, traditional schooling, then what? And of course, what I think I can answer that is reading. The necessity of reading as a key skill for all other things is already going down rapidly and will continue to decline. Right, writing the same. I talked to a woman who was running a billion dollar education company. She said, oh, my 12 year old son, he never types anything. He just dictates and then he edits a little bit. 
but I think that's, that's, a, that's not such a good example, but reading is more important. I listen to books, I read books. I go to dinner parties, 10 years ago, people talk books, even 15 years ago, more. Now people talk movies. Um, I hang around with PhDs a lot, you know, and they're talking movies. <laughs> they're not talking books much. So, yeah. Well, I can probably say that my fifth grader son probably learns more from YouTube than reading books. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So things are happening. They're changing. For voice interactive becoming a key piece of so many things. And it's just gonna, it's gonna take off. It's already taking off. I, I think it was it was Reagan that started it, but they used to get a note, you know, the president used to get a, a, a briefing book every morning. It was newspaper clippings from around the country. And starting with Reagan and continuing to Obama and other, you know, high-powered smart people who are president, they get video briefing books. What is, what is the United States seeing on TV? Not reading. At any rate, I think time's up and we should stop. So yeah, thank you, um, everyone. And thank you to our presenters uh, for a wonderful um, and insightful and informative presentation. We really appreciate um, everyone attending. Um, on behalf of IES, uh, we would invite you to rate this session on the agenda page under the tab for this session um, uh, on a scale of one to five, how useful this was to your work. And also feel free to continue this conversation on the message boards. Um, the link was shared in the chat uh, to access those message boards. And once again, thank you, everyone.